We've already talked about the MSX, but now we move on a generation to the MSX2. How do you continue a computing legacy whilst keeping up with the rest of the industry? If you haven't watched the original MSX video, then I recommend going back a bit to it. But as a recap, the MSX was a computing standard introduced in Japan by the ASCII Corporation and Microsoft. It set the minimum requirements of a 3.58 MHz Z80 CPU, 8K of RAM, an AY3-8910 sound chip, and a TMS-9918 video display processor. As long as the machines were at least compatible with the specification, the companies could expand their computers. In reality, the minimum amount of memory ended up being 16K, and usually nearer 32. Adhering to this specification and using a compatible MSX BIOS with MSX BASIC, a version of Microsoft BASIC, meant that several manufacturers could make computers that would use the same software, a model used by the 3DO company later on. The MSX2 increased the specification slightly. 64K became the minimum, and 128K pretty much became the standard, especially in Europe. Yamaha took over the reins from Texas Instruments to produce the video display processor. They introduced the V9938. This increased the video RAM from 16K to at least 64, although with several using 128. A new 80x24 text mode was added, and bitmap video modes, which fixed the attribute clash problems that the MSX1 sometimes suffered from. Two new resolutions were added, a 512x212 16 color mode, and a 256x212 256 color mode. The sprites were improved. It still had 32 sprites, but now they could have 16 colors instead of one, and they could handle eight sprites per line double that of the predecessor. Several hardware acceleration features were added, including drawing and blitting routines, plus enhanced scrolling support. These features were added while still maintaining compatibility with MSX1 games. Sound was slightly improved with the Yamaha YM2149, replacing the general instrument's AY3-8910. These additions kept the MSX2 machines competitive when they were first released in 1985. With 128K becoming pretty much standard in Europe, the specs lined up nicely with machines being released by Sinclair, Amstrad and Commodore. Unfortunately, whilst this spec bump was popular in Japan, it still didn't help to increase the MSX's market share across Europe, and it had very little impact outside of the areas it was already popular. Right, well, let's take a look at the machine we have here. Okay, so what we have here is a Sanyo Wavy 23, and this is obviously an MSX2 computer. Uh, it's got 64K of memory and 128K of VRAM. It uh, isn't normally quite this color. This one has a little bit of discoloration over time. Uh, yeah, it's a fairly nice keyboard. It's got a nice bit of travel on. They're quite, they're quite stiff. It works quite well. Uh, to Oh, slightly sticky. <laughs> I need to. I've literally only got this one a little while ago. If you see the unboxing when this arrived, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, I do need to do a lot of work on it other than get it working, which I have done. Um, so, yeah, so two cartridge slots. Uh, this reset button, which is barely moves, I think that's probably normal though. Uh, there's two lights here to show the caps lock and uh, one of the other locks. Um, if we have a look at the rest of the machine. There we go. On the back here, we can see we have uh, the printer port here. <laughs> no, uh, no helpful uh, top level uh, text on this one, so I would have to look. <laughs> RGP. Uh, we have our composite sound and video there. Uh, a channel select for the RF switch here, and uh, yeah, the built-in power lead, which was yeah very much did almost destroyed when I got it, but it's. Uh, we got it working, so that was fine. On the side, we have a fairly chunky power switch. And on this side, we have, oh, there we go. It's not heavy, heavy, but it's, it's quite long, so it makes it harder to, to move around. Yeah, so on this side, we have uh, the two joystick ports and a cassette port over here. So uh, yeah, nothing on the front, obviously. It's, um, it's a little bit rattling around in there, but I'm sure that's nothing serious, hopefully. Yeah, it's... It's an interesting shaped machine. It's a weird shape here, which um, I don't know. You can't say that it's like a wrist rest because that would just be for the 
the arrow keys, I guess maybe. That's <laughs> it's a bit weird though. Um, I guess you could call it a wavy shape, so that's fair enough. Uh, I like it anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting shape. Plus it was relatively cheap because of all it of course is not working because it wasn't when I got it. No, there wasn't very much wrong with it in the end. Yes, they're um this is probably one of the I wouldn't say least desirable, but certainly not up there with like the, the Sony's uh, MSX2 machines and things like that but it, it's uh, it's a lovely little machine and it does work so that's the important thing I recently made an RGB cable for it they're not too difficult just fiddly like all RGB cables always are but yeah it's um it is an interesting little machine and um when you you see some of the MSX2 specific games like especially certain famous ones like the Metal Gear series which started of course really started on these machines although historically didn't start but certainly series started on these machines uh, you really can see that these machines had quite a lot of power to push around um, anyway that's all summary stuff so we'll get to that in a minute but <laughs> let's move on to some games Right, well, the MSX deserved to do better than it did. Uh, several incredibly polished and impressive computers were released based on the spec, uh, and the MSX2 pushed that even further. When you look at the changes at high level, it doesn't look like um, there were a large amount done. It doesn't look like there was, there was a mass change, but the changes that were made were impactful. They were very, they were important changes, and they really did push the MSX standard to the top of that 80s tech tree. Um, but that only really matters when you get the sales. <laughs> uh, and just unfortunately, MSX never really got the market outside of Japan, apart from a few pockets here and there. Uh, and that really held it back. And it is a shame. They are nice machines. Right, so should you buy one? And obviously, there's still two parts to this story that we haven't covered yet. And they are going to be ones that, well, we'll cover hopefully at some point. But it will take a while because that's the MSX 2 Plus, which is, again, small additions to the, to the range. Um, they're quite hard to get a hold of and quite expensive. And then there's the, uh, the R turbo machines. And yeah, those are really expensive and hard to get a hold of. So eventually I hope to get them because I want them anyway, but I'll hope to get them so we can finish off this story because it's the story that deserves to be told. So, um, yes, you know what? You, you absolutely should get an MSX machine. If you can get an MSX2 machine, then, then all the better because you have access to more games and with, perhaps compatibly with the previous library, um, which if you include Japanese games, it's a really big library with some really impressive titles. Um, now the MSX2 obviously does carry a premium, uh, especially European models. European models are, are quite expensive, though they do exist. Um, but again, yeah, you've got a wider market if you do manage to get a, a, an MSX2. But you know, if you only get, manage to get an MSX1, then there's lots of those. You can find those for fairly reasonable prices, especially if you don't mind shopping in Japan. 
then um, then your market is much wider and you can still play quite a lot of the games anyway so yeah it's uh, if you're, even if you can only get an MSS1 it's still worth doing <laughs> right thanks for watching if you enjoyed the video please hit like if you really enjoyed the video please hit subscribe if you didn't enjoy the video or you have something else to say then please leave it in the comments below uh, and hit the bell icon thing to get told of videos when they come out <laughs> see you next time